the President of the United States. Sounds like a bunch of Republicans out there. <laughs> now that was quick. <laughs> Reformed Republicans. <laughs> when I was a boy, uh, there was a public hanging over in Louisiana. And the deputy sheriff said to the poor condemned man, he said, uh, According to state law, you have five minutes in which to choose the words that you want to use as your last act. And the poor old fellow said, well, Mr. Sheriff, I, I just don't have anything to say, so why don't you go on and get it over with. And the fellow jumped up in the back of the audience, and he said, Mr. Sheriff, if he doesn't want those five minutes, I'd like to have them. I'm a candidate for Congress. <laughs> Politician. <laughs> Politicians. I'm reminded of a story about uh, Darrell Royo, coach of one of our underfunded University of Texas football teams. <laughs> <laughs> now, Darrell sent one of his uh, star quarterbacks up to Washington, D.C. to be interviewed uh, by the great Otto Graham of the Washington Redskins. And uh, Graham said to the boy, he said, I hear you're a triple threat man, son. Tell me about yourself. Well, the su youngster summoned up all of his Texas courage. And he said, well, coach, I can run 100 yards in a little over nine seconds on a muddy field. So that's very good. What about your passing? 61 yards, sir, average for the season. Mm -hmm. And your punting? 71 yards, sir, average for the season, against the wind. <laughs> Graham said, well, that's very good. Now, most of us have our good points and our bad points, and you seem to have your share of good ones. Tell me about your bad ones. Without a moment's hesitancy, the young man says, well, coach, sometimes I do exaggerate a little. <laughs> Politicians <laughs> tend to exaggerate, overstate. So if I overstate here tonight, I hope you won't charge it to my credibility, but to my Texas generosity. There used to be a rule. When I first came to Washington, there used to be a rule that you never quoted anybody after he'd had two drinks. <laughs> and you never quoted anything anybody said after nine o'clock at night. <laughs> well, I've only had one of my two drinks. <laughs> and it's not after nine o'clock at night, but I don't want to be quoted. I mean that. I don't want you to repeat anything I say. We're going to have a little straight talk in here tonight. I am not a bitter man. Texas doesn't breed bitter men. We might get a little vengeful sometimes, but we're not bitter. <laughs> what I am, however, is goddamn man. Other night after a cabinet meeting here at the White House, I asked if there were any questions. Now, I don't very often do that because I don't have the time. And they all looked a little surprised. And Wilbur Corn, you know Wilbur Corn, looks like a little Jewish tailor from Brooklyn, but I put him in a cabinet anyway. <laughs> now, now, I could get along without Bird easier than I could get along without Wilbur, which is what I tell him. <laughs> but then I may have told that to several of my people, especially if they show some indication of wanting to resign. <laughs> Wilbur raised his hand, said, yes, Mr. President, I have a question. The other night, my 14-year-old son and several of his friends were sitting around my house, and they asked me, why are we in Vietnam?
And he said that his answer didn't satisfy these young men who might have to serve. And I thought, my Lord, my Lord, after all these years, I still have to explain Vietnam to them. So I did. I let them have it. I give them 20 goddamn minutes on why American forces are in Vietnam. And at the end of that time, these men, these members of the cabinet who had been with me, stood by me, sustained me in my, my effort. I would go so far as to say, encouraged their commander in chief in his endeavors. These men sat there and looked at me like I was from the moon. The moon. Lyndon Johnson's war. Well, it isn't my war. It's our war. Oh, I don't mean yours and mine, friends and neighbors, although God knows it is. I mean, I am not alone in the manufacturing of this war. Why aren't these telephones lighting up? Just checking. However, I don't stand here before you as your president because I didn't want to be your president. In fact, as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be and I thought I could be president of the United States in spite of who I was or, or where I came from. As my old friend and mentor from Texas, Mr. Sam Rayburn, said of me when he nominated me at the 1960 Democratic Convention, he said he was a poor boy, but he dreamed great dreams. You see, when I grew up, there was no way for a cotton-picking kid from Texas to be elected president. Now, when I say cotton-picking, I mean that literally. When I was born in Texas, everybody picked cotton. You didn't pick cotton, you weren't in society. <laughs> well, I was in society. <laughs> <laughs> I also had me the Lyndon B. Johnson shoeshine stand in the back of the barbershop, and I like that because I could listen to the men talking politics. Not that I just listen. <laughs> no, my daddy. My daddy used to wake me before the sun was up. He'd say, get up, Lyndon. Every boy in town's got an hour start on you. You'll never catch up. You'll always be an hour late and a dollar short. So I used to get up earlier than anybody else. By that time the shop opened, I'd read the whole goddamn newspaper to what those men didn't know about politics or any other damn thing. I told them. <laughs> that was my daddy. Sam Ely Johnson, Jr. <laughs> he was in politics about that time himself. Now, he was serving in the Texas State Legislature. That's him on the left there. Can you see? It's a little far back, but that's him. He was serving in the Texas State Legislature at $5 a day plus $2 a day for special sessions, so he was rich. Well, things were looking up for the Johnson family, I can tell you that much. My daddy had a mind of his own. He kept a razor strap on the back porch, and one side was for sharpening the razor, of course, and the other side was for sharpening mines and behinds. <laughs> he had a mind of his own. <laughs> At that time in Texas, I don't believe there were more than 30, 35 percent of the people that didn't think that the Ku Klux Klan was mighty fine. My daddy stood up in the Texas House of Representatives, and he let fly against that clan. He called them Ku Klux sons of bitches, just like that, like it was one word. <laughs> you, know, you know, I was in high school. I was an educated man before I made the discovery that son of a bitch could stand on its own. <laughs> My daddy, he was a fine man. My mother, Well, my mother was a beautiful lady. You know, she was ashamed of but one thing. She'd had to work so hard, her hands were all red. Now, in later years, when Bird and I brought her up to Washington, introduced her to all the fine ladies, not a one of which was finer than her, I'd see my mother standing off in the corner, hiding her hands. Oh, I just hated that. You know, I believe 
that the proudest moment in my mother's life was that Sunday morning when I hitchhiked off to San Marcos State Teachers College. My mother was bound and determined that I would get a college education. I'd make something out of myself. I'd spend part of that winter working on a road repair gang, and it had been cold, oh, very cold. <laughs> so the prospect of spending the spring as a college student held some appeal for me. <laughs> but I made a very unpleasant discovery. My high school had only gone up to the 11th grade, so I wasn't eligible for college. Well, now my mother, my dear sweet mother, sat up all night with me, several nights in a row, trying to help me memorize enough plain geometry to pass a test and be admitted to school. Seventy was passing, and I made a seventy. <laughs> Oh, I don't believe I've had a goddamn bit of use for plain geometry ever since. <laughs> but by then, I'd seen that the only way up out of the situation I was in is to get a college education. So I took the money I got from working on the road gang. I saved some of it anyway. I went down to Johnson City Bank, and I, I borrowed $75. $75. And I worked on the campus, too. I had to. My first job was digging rocks, did some painting, did some janitoring, sold socks door to door real silk socks. In my senior year, I edited the college newspaper in my spare time for $30 a month. You know, I don't believe I ever worked so hard, either before or since, <laughs> as I did my senior year in college. But when I graduated, my dear sweet mother had the comfort of knowing that I had a profession. Now, I was qualified to teach students. Good morning, boys and girls. My name's Mr. Johnson, and I'm your teacher. And we're going to speak English in this class not Spanish, <laughs> only, only English. You will say, good morning, Mr. Johnson. Now, come on, good, good morning, Mr. Johnson. Well, and how are you today, Mr. Johnson? And how are you today, Mr. Johnson? How do you do, Mr. Johnson? How do you do? Is there anything that we can do for you? We will do it if we can. We'll stand by you to a man. How do you do, Mr. Johnson? How do you do, do, do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do fine. And I'm a Texan. And I'm an American, like you, like all of you. And I'm proud. You know why? Because we live in a big country, and there's big opportunity, and if you work hard and you study hard, what can you be? Does anybody know what you can be? Anybody? President, President of the United States. <laughs> you must be a teacher. <laughs> you know, I often walked home late in the afternoon after the classes were finished, wishing that there was more I could do for them. But all I knew to do was to teach them what little I knew in the hopes it'd somehow protect them against the, the hardships that I knew lay ahead. I had been poor, I suppose, but uh, until I taught school in Catula, Texas, those Mexican-American kids, I hadn't known what poor was. They'd come to school hungry, hungry without even having had breakfast. And they never seemed to know why people disliked them so. But they knew that it was so, because I could see it in their eyes. Somehow, even in their youth, they knew the pain of prejudice. You never forget that. When you see scars on the hopeful face of a young child, never forget what hatred and poverty can do. I'll never forget their eyes. Yeah. Bird, where are you? Well, I'm here. I'm here with a few of my loyal supporters. <laughs> well, I'm getting a few things off my chest. Well, honey, I was hoping you'd drop by a little bit later on and back me up. No. Mm -mm. No. Uh, no. Yeah. Yes, I will. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, Mr. Johnson just informed me that uh, whatever may unfold here tonight, 
I have absolutely nothing whatsoever to apologize for. <laughs> and I need hardly add, she is a very astute lady. And of course, she's totally unbiased. <laughs> While we're on the subject of Mrs. Johnson, <laughs> there's something I'd like to clear up. There's been a whole, whole lot of talk about her financial contributions to my various political campaigns. Now, I just want to say right now that the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> my very first campaign, my pretty little bird came to me. She said, how much will it cost? I told her $10,000. She said, $10,000 just to try and get elected. <laughs> All of you out there won't understand that story. <laughs> She went to her daddy, and she asked him to advance her the money that she would get from her mother's inheritance. Yeah. And that's not all she did. She didn't just bankroll the campaign. I'd come home between speeches, I'd throw down a bag of laundry on the floor, and she'd do that too. Now, I don't call that being a good wife. I call that being just a perfect wife, <laughs> especially for a politician. But there's something else that I want to say about Mrs. Johnson. And it says, I know that it had, hadn't been for Lady Bird, some people might have abandoned the LBJ ship a long time ago. And it doesn't matter whether a ship veers from its course from time to time, as long as it comes back to its home port, to its anchor. Lady Bird was the only woman I ever cared about, never wanted to care about. In the fall of 1934, first time I ever set eyes on Lady Bird, I said, that woman's going to be my wife. And I asked her to marry me on our first date. She was impressed. <laughs> but she wasn't stampeded. No. She said to her Aunt Effie, she said, he's too tall. He's gangly. He talks incessantly. He's really quite repulsive. <laughs> but it wasn't too long till she realized I was really handsome and smart and extremely bright. She didn't stand a chance once I set eyes on her. Daddy helped. He said, honey, some of the best trades I ever did, I did in a hurry. <laughs> he said, you brought home a lot of boys. This is the first time you brought home a man. <laughs> oh, and I wrote to her, too. That first year when we were apart so much, I wrote to her every single day almost. And I took great care with every comma, every adjective, every semicolon. <laughs> she never let me get away with a goddamn thing. <laughs> and it's still that way in my household. Two daughters and a wife. Uh, I'm outvoted. <laughs> you know, there's not a raised toilet seat in my house. <laughs> uh, I'm outvoted by the greatest natural resource in this country today, and that's woman power. <laughs> Sweetheart, make sure these lines are kept clear. No. No, goddammit, I'm just trying to make sure you're doing your job. You know, if I'd been born before the invention of this damn thing, I wouldn't have been worth a goddamn. <laughs> About the most important telephone call I ever got, maybe, came to me one afternoon in the administrative office of the Sam Houston High School. It was Mr. Dick on the line. Richard Kleberg, one of the owners of the King Ranch, which I need hardly tell anyone here was and still is, only slightly larger than the state of Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Mr. Dick, now Mr. Dick had been elected to Congress, and somebody, somebody had told him he'd need a bright young man to help him out up there in Washington and recommended me. So Mr. Dick and his wife, Ms. Mamie, who never cared much for me, but then I never cared much for her either. We all went up to Washington. Ms. Mamie, oh, she sure was a pain. She had me running all over Washington like a gopher. Do this, do that, go over there. I got a little short with her one day. Well, she got real mad at me, and she stormed into the office, and she said to Mr. Dick, either Lyndon goes or I go. Well, I'm proud to say, Mr. Dick hesitated. <laughs> uh, I might have made that up. <laughs> uh, we all went up to Washington on the train together. 
You know, I'd hardly even ridden on a train before. And we got to Union Station, and it was cold, and it was bleak, and it was raining like a cow pissing on a flat rock. <laughs> but I came out of that station, and there it was, right there in front of me. The Capitol Dome. Oh, I tell you, I don't believe I'd ever seen anything so fine in all my life. I love this city. I love this city. Oh, you can imagine the people you're passing on the street are congressmen, maybe senators, maybe even members of the cabinet. And there's a smell of power about Washington. Oh, it has an odor. Power has. And I've felt right at home in Washington, right quick. But the first thing I did was cultivate the Western Union boys. That way, I got the news first. And congressional staffs were smaller than they are now, so it was easier to find out things like which congressman had a drinking problem, <laughs> <laughs> which of them was uh, misbehaving in whichever way, which of them was interested in uh, sexual escapades, just useful information. And which of them had real power? That's what interested me the most. I'd say to myself, how'd he do it? How'd he get it? What's the secret? Does he know someone? And I knew it wasn't just an accident or luck. I don't believe in luck. So when opportunity came my way, I moved in fast. Stop the truck. I said, stop the truck. There's a man plowing over there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Howdy, neighbor. Goddamn barbed wire. <laughs> More goddamn barbed wire in Hayes County, Texas. <laughs> You're wearing Hell's Half Acre. Howdy, neighbor. Shit. Oh, God. Ow. Howdy, neighbor. My name's Lyndon Johnson. Maybe you know my daddy, Sam Ely Johnson, Jr. He's a farmer, too. Well, I thought you would. Now, I see you plowing. I don't want to take up too much of your time, so I won't hedge none. I want to be your new congressman from the 10th District. Y'all got electricity out here? No? Oh, that's a crying shame. We're going to have to get to work on that. Now, I take you to be a Roosevelt man. Am I right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm with Roosevelt right down the line. You know, I couldn't help but notice that is a mighty bum road you got out there. That could show stand some fixing. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I just want to say howdy to a neighbor. Give my regards your measures. And uh, I know you won't forget Lyndon Johnson when you go to polls. <laughs> Goddamn. It was with some satisfaction I received the news that my victory had made the front page of the New York Times. My seven opponents had just gone down into defeat. Like my friend, my dear liberal friend, Maury Maverick. He just got out there too far ahead of his people. <laughs> to be an effective politician, you have to survive. You have to survive. I may not have been all that liberal, but I was a hell of a lot more liberal than I voted. <laughs> now, I didn't want to get out there too far ahead of Texas. My main concern for my people at that time was electricity. They had mighty hard lives in my part of Texas, and cheap electricity could change everything. All I wanted to do was to run a simple rural electric line to the farmers in my part of the hill country, and the power companies wouldn't let me do it. Now, I hadn't known I needed their permission, but I found out I did. So I went to see the head of one of the most powerful power companies in Texas. He was a tall man. He was striking, had long gray hair, looked a good deal like a Methodist bishop. And he had but one word, cooperate. I want to cooperate, he'd say. <laughs> And he just cooperated me out of every meeting I ever went into, and I failed. I failed every step of the way. 
well, I just can't abide failure. So finally, in desperation, I went to see President Roosevelt. Yes, sir. Now? Right now? Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> yes, sir, in here. Mr. President, Mr. President, I'm, I'm here to ask you for your influence to help me get a loan for the Perdinalis Electrical Cooperative. Well, I started in talking. <laughs> he interrupted me to ask me a question, which to this day I still don't believe. He looked me right in the eye, and he said, have you ever seen a Russian woman naked? <laughs> oh, I was so flustered, I asked him to repeat the question. <laughs> and he did. Have you ever seen a Russian woman naked? I said, no, sir, but I haven't been to Russia yet. <laughs> oh, oh, he, he started talking. He told me that uh, Harry Hopkins just come back from Russia and that Russian women had a different physique from that of American women because they did heavy work. And as a result, it had an effect on their muscles, and he was very interested in that. <laughs> well, I had, I had some pictures, I had some photographs of the Buck Cannon Dam and the power lines that led out of Austin and on into Houston and Dallas. And I had a picture of one of those little old tenant farmer houses sitting right under the power line. Well, I showed these to Roosevelt. You see, sir, see these power lines here? They're just a wheeling with power, and all those Texas big shots from from Houston Power and Light and from Texas Power and Light, well, they're getting all of this power. And this poor fellow here, sitting right under the line, almost shattered by it. Well, he can't get any. I walked out of there with a million dollar loan. Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Only man I ever knew anywhere who was never afraid. Well, I became known as Roosevelt's boy. He seemed like an old man to me. He'd call me up. I'd go down and sit with him and have a meal. And he seemed almost, almost like my daddy to me. When he died, you know what I thought of? I just thought of all the little folks, just what they lost. When he died, Bird said, honey, he's gone. Who do we have now? I said, honey, we got Truman. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be the goddamn scramble for power in this town in the next two weeks that anybody ever saw in their whole life. So I went back on the campaign trail, trying for the U.S. Senate. Now, I tried once before and lost my one defeat. I'd lost to Papio Daniel, governor of Texas, Papio Daniel. Oh, Pappy's campaign mostly had to do with God. He barnstormed the state, talking about the Ten Commandments, talking about the Golden Rule. And then Texas Rose would step up to the microphone and sing a song he'd written called The Boy Who Never Gets Too Big to Comb His Mother's Hair. <laughs> oh, he had one other big hit. Them hillbillies are politicians now. <laughs> and I was out there talking about full parity prices for farmers and federal old age pension and state control over natural resources. And I didn't stand a chance. <laughs> oh, Pappy beat me. Beat the hell out of me. Well, Pappy was long gone, but I'd learned a thing or two from him. This time, Bird and I, we got ourselves a starlet, and she sang, God Bless America. <laughs> and I had me an ace in the hole. I had promoted me a helicopter, and I would swoop down over those little Texas towns, and I'd hover there in the air, and I had me a bullhorn, and I'd shout, hello, down there. This is your friend, Lyndon Johnson. Now, I'm sorry we can't land today, but I want you all to know I'm up here. And I'm thinking of you. 
And I want y'all to come on over to the county seat and hear me speak. And they'd all come. Mostly, of course, they came to see the helicopter. They'd never seen one before. <laughs> and I won that election. <laughs> and when I won it, some optimistic Texans were saying that I could go all the way. I could be elected president. But it seemed clear to me and other experienced politicians that uh, uh, nobody from Texas could ever be elected president. Nope. Not the president, just the most powerful man in Washington, majority leader, best job I ever had. Now, why was I so powerful? I decided which of the president's bills, this is President Eisenhower now, I decided which of his bills we Democrats would back and which not. I made the delicate decision of whether a bill was worth risking defeat for. I control who was put on what committee, sometimes who wasn't. When a bill came out of committee, I decided when it come to floor, I decided when go to a vote, timing, 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 timing. You had to strike when the time was exactly right. I don't know why old friends, liberal supporters, couldn't accept the fact that I had to change. What did they expect me to do? I represented Texas in the U.S. Senate. Gas, oil. You wouldn't expect some senator from Wisconsin to vote against the dairy industry, would you? Would you? No, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> Survival. I spoke against civil rights. I said it was up to the states whether they'd outlaw the poll tax or not. I said it was none of the federal government's business to enforce the laws against lynching, survival. We didn't have the votes. We didn't have any votes. Timing. I intended to be there later on. I had to be there later on. Timing. It was just too soon. timing. Well, now, you take, uh, take Adlai Stevenson. Adlai was a master of timing. Bad timing. <laughs> Ho! Oh, Adlai was an able man, but he didn't have a clue how to campaign. He'd be out there, some supermarket somewhere, shaking hands, making a speech, and some pretty little girl in a pretty starched frock would come up to him and hand him a stuffed alligator. <laughs> now, what you say then is, why, thank you, little girl. A stuffed alligator. <laughs> Just what I've always wanted for my mantelpiece in Libertyville. But Adlai would look at it and say, for Christ's sakes, what's this? <laughs> That's a true story, Judd. <laughs> I know there's people out there thinking me as some kind of a corn pone clodhopper. Goes around pulling his dog up by his ears showing his Operation Scar, intellectuals from Harvard, people from Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> I know they don't accept me, and I know they never will accept me, but there's, there's something that I want to know now, and it's this. Why is it that when I say it, it comes out bullshit? But when Ben Bradley of the Washington Post says it, it comes out Chanel number five. <laughs> oh. Bobby. Bobby Kennedy. I know what the Kennedy family felt about me. I know what they thought about me. I know what they said about me behind my back 
the runt, Bobby. He didn't even bother to try and hide it. Jack. Jack bent over backwards to try and cover it up, to try and give me dignity, especially after I became part of the team. Simmer down, Ladybird. Simmer down. I will not have another heart attack. God damn it. God damn it. Kennedy's got this nomination, and if he's elected, I just have to face the fact I will no longer be Mr. Democrat in these United States. And the Republicans have nominated Dick Nixon. Dick Nixon. Oh, I could stomach Dick Nixon just fine if I didn't know the difference between chicken salad and chicken shit. <laughs> I'm sorry, honey. Well, he's narrow, he's a loner, he's a partisan, won't collaborate, doesn't trust the legislative process. Either way, I lose. Either way, my relationship with the White House is finished. What? I am relaxed. Keep moving, boy, keep moving, keep moving. Going somewhere, keep moving. What's that, Bert? Vice President, I might, if he asked me. If he asked me. Yeah. Jack, congratulations. I see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask you something, Jack. Do you really want me? Because if you really want me, I'll do it. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Two seconds later, two seconds later, the doorbell rang, and there stands the runt. Bobby, come on in. <laughs> I was just talking to your brother. Yeah, I know he's under a lot of pressure. He was just saying. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of opposition against me. He was just telling me. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah, yeah, Jack, your brother's here. Oh, well, uh, apparently he didn't get the word. No, 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 I'll tell him. No, 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 Jack, I'll be glad to tell him. <laughs> That's all right, these things happen. <laughs> Bobby, your brother just told me to tell you that he's offered, and I've accepted, the candidacy for Vice President of the United States. Apparently, somebody in your normally efficient organization <laughs> screwed up. <laughs> oh, oh, he was in a state of shock. <laughs> he turned tail, went down that hotel hallway. His Adam's apple was bobbing up and down like a yo-yo. <laughs> Politics. Politics makes strange bedfellows. Well, I campaigned for him, and I won with him. And the night that I became Vice President of the United States, I believe I was the most depressed I've ever been in my entire life. <laughs> I couldn't help but, I couldn't help but think of that poor old woman who lost both of her sons. One of them went away to sea, and the other one became Vice President. <laughs> 
and neither one of them was ever heard of again. <laughs> but I did the job. I did the job. I worked 24 hours a day. I fetched and I toted. And I played second fiddle. But I want to tell you something. From that day until the day that he died, nobody ever heard me say one word against John Kennedy. Never. He was the President of the United States. And his death, when it came, it hit us hard. Most people don't know. We went to Texas not for votes, but for money. And Dallas was where the money was, mostly in pledges for the coming campaign. But politics down home was real disturbed about that time. Right-wing forces were festering. And John Conley didn't have a bit of control over those people, not a bit. And the president was told all this. He was told all of this. And all he said was, I understand. That just makes it more interesting. <laughs> There's something that I want to explain to you. Something that I've tried to explain to myself over and over again since that fateful day. The Secret Service had wanted us to go directly from the airport to the trademark where the president was due to make his speech. Just straight there, no public parade. But it was decided, and I went along with it, to move slowly and circuitously through the streets of Dallas, a public show. I wanted that. Any politician would. And John Kennedy was every bit as much of a politician as I am, every bit as savvy, and he didn't hesitate. He readily agreed. What I'm trying to tell you is he was not being moved through the streets of Dallas so he could be shot at. What I do question is, no, I don't. I don't question it. If you're going to have a motorcade, you want people to turn out for that motorcade. So you publish the root of it. And there was a map of it that morning in the Dallas News. I just don't see any point in questioning that. And people did turn out. They turned out in their thousands. And it was very gratifying to see how much they seemed to love us. Well, at least the president. They gave his automobile a terrific hand as he drove by. And Jackie, oh, Jackie was just plain beautiful. In her pretty pink suit and a pretty pink hat. She was smiling radiant, charming. You know people were rushing up to just to try and touch that car. I thought, my Lord, my Lord, this certainly lays to rest any fears we might have had. And just at that moment, we turned that corner. And on a building up ahead, I could see the words, Texas, school book, Depository. I don't know how to tell you all what happened next. You all know what happened next. When we reached the ambulance entrance to the hospital, I could see Governor Connolly being helped out of his car, and there was a great big gob of red blood all across the front of his shirt. And Jack, the 
president was lying on his face in the back seat of the car, and there were there was a pool of blood on the floor of the car, and there were some twisted roses lying in it. I heard somebody say, "That's the president, isn't it?" Said, "Yes." Said, "I don't know. Is he dead?" Said, "I don't know." That's all we heard. Bird and I were shoved into the hospital by the Secret Service, down the hall, into the first room they came to, and they shut the door, pulled down all the blinds, and we sat there in stunned silence, shock, just waiting, waiting for news. After a while, the door opened. Secret Service man came in. He said but two words. He's gone. He's gone. Bird began to cry. And I thought, now, now, I knew I was on my own. And I knew that this terrifying thing might be part of some international conspiracy. It was my responsibility. I had to do something quickly and calmly. I told him not to announce the president's death that we were in an unmarked car en route to Air Force One. But we wouldn't leave until after Mrs. Johnson had seen Mrs. Kennedy. The Secret Service brought her into a small little hallway, and there sat Jackie, all alone. You always think of somebody like that as being so protected and so insulated. But Bird said she never saw any woman so alone in her whole life. She went up to her and she put her arms around her and held her. Oh, she hugged her. And she said, God, help us all. When we got to the airport, it was a very peculiar feeling to be getting on board Air Force One, to realize that we had the right to do that. I immediately put in a call to the Attorney General. Ever since that call, I've always thought of Bobby Kennedy differently. He knew that his brother had been killed. But we had important matters to discuss, when the oath of office should be administered and by whom, and he discussed all of these things in very business-like tone of voice, but underneath. Let's just say it's never been quite so easy for me to hate Bobby Kennedy ever since. Well, he wanted me to take the oath immediately before leaving Dallas, and we didn't have the oath. Somebody called the White House, and they dug it up out of the archives, and they gave it over the telephone to Jack Valenti, and he wrote it down on the back of an invoice. Meantime, they're trying to locate Sarah Hughes, the judge in Dallas that I wanted to administer the oath when Mrs. Kennedy arrived with the casket. And she was still wearing that pretty pink suit and pink hat. Only now they were streaked and soiled with her husband's blood. She put her hand on that casket as they loaded it into the plane. But she seemed, we thought, almost unaware of what was happening. There was a frightening little frozen smile on her face. She went back in the back of the plane with the casket. And Judge Hughes arrived. And I knew that we had to proceed. So I sent word back to Mrs. Kennedy to ask her if she would, well, if she could, bear 
to be a part of the ceremony. And she said that she would like to come out. And when she did, she was still wearing that pretty pink dress. You know, it seemed like she thought that as long as she kept that dress on, maybe things might go back and be like what they were that morning when she'd stepped off that plane so lovely and so happy. I asked Mrs. Kennedy to stand on my left. I asked Mrs. Johnson to stand on my right. And Judge Hughes leaned forward and said to Mrs. Kennedy, I loved your husband so very, very much. You know, I don't believe Mrs. Kennedy heard her. I put my hand on a Bible. I, Lyndon Baines Johnson, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And then Judge Hughes added, so help me God, which isn't in the oath. But I said, so help me God. And I was the President of the United States. There are plenty of people who wish I had gone into some other line of work. <laughs> well, it's one thing to visit the White House, to be a guest in this house, which even as the Vice President suffered by the Kennedys is what it was, it's something else to call it home to sit down to supper in the White House, to put on your pajamas and go up to bed and sleep in the White House. Oh, I felt like I'd come a long way from that basement room in the Dodge Hotel where I'd first lived when I first came to Washington. You know, I wish my mother had lived to see me as president. Of course, she had lived to see you. See me as majority leader, so she knew her Lyndon was a success. But still, even now, when I, I sometimes receive a somewhat flattering introduction, I, I often wish my mother and my father could have been there to hear it because my father would have enjoyed it and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> but now, when I became president, I felt, I felt confident. I felt like I was the right man for the job. Of course, it did take some, some getting used to. <laughs> I mean, the changes. Oh, for instance, <clears throat> first trip that Bird and I made back down to the ranch after I became president, well, now that was a shock. See, down in my hill country, we have this fine old tradition. After supper, the men folk go out onto the porch, and they look up at the moon and the stars, and they commune with nature. And then they pee out into the night. <laughs> That's what my daddy did ahead of me, and my daddy's daddy ahead of him, and if I ever had a son, I'd hope and expect he'd do the same thing. <laughs> well, we had a fine supper that night. It was a fine supper, and it was, it was fit for president. After it, I, well, I stepped out onto the porch. I looked up at the moon and the stars, and I communed with nature, and then I felt the call. So I just let fly when, goddamn, if five floodlights don't go on, a siren starts up and eight Secret Service men jump out of the bushes, come running at me, there stands the President of the United States trying to take a fine old traditional leak. <laughs> End of a tradition. <laughs> now that's a raunchy story, but you liked it. 
I insisted that the highest judicial officer in the United States be appointed the commission to investigate the assassination of President Kennedy. Chief Justice Earl Warren was the only man I ever considered for the job. He had an untarnished record. He was, he was a free thinker. He was independent. He'd been appointed by a Republican. I knew that I had to distance myself from his inquiry as much as possible. And Judge Warren was a man I hadn't spent 10 minutes with in my entire life. When he handed me this report, I studied it, and I studied it very, very carefully indeed. And it concluded, after examining massive amounts of evidence, that Lee Harvey Oswald, alone and unaided and desiring a place in history, had murdered our president. And many people were satisfied with that, but others were not. I was not. Oh, I accepted. I could believe that Oswald pulled the trigger. I do believe that. But I don't believe and never did believe that he acted alone. My suspicions fell particularly upon Fidel Castro and the Cubans because when I took office here, I discovered that we had been operating a goddamn murder incorporated down in the Caribbean trying to kill Castro. Now, I know there are I'm not unaware of all the other conspiracy theories out there based on information and details which seem to contradict and undermine this report. But none of them, including my own, had any corroborated or new evidence that was clear. So what is the point of going on and on, turning over rocks, just to see what's under them? All that does is contribute to the mistrust and the blaming and the self-doubt that is eating this country like a cancer. It doesn't help anybody, least of all the Kennedy family. They've suffered enough. It is time to get this nation back to its urgent domestic priorities. But there is one thing that I would like to deal with point blank, and it's this. Right after the assassination, somebody came back from Russia and said that the first Russian they talked to said, do you think Johnson organized it? Do you think I organized it? Well, if you do, if any of you do, that's your right. All I can say is, you don't know me. I am not a murderer. Right after that fateful day, I called in the president's closest advisors and asked them what they thought the agenda of my administration, what was left of it, ought to be. Many of them were of the opinion that civil rights would never get through, that I ought not to expend the limited coinage of my presidency on it. Well, what the hell is the presidency for? Get me Roy Wilkins. Uh, yes, I want to talk to Walter Heller. You get me Hubert Humphrey right now. <clears throat> Yes? Roy! Roy, this is your president. Well, I know I wasn't voted in, Roy, but I'm the only president you've got. <laughs> <laughs> now, as head of the NAACP, Roy, I would appreciate it if you and whichever of the blacks that you designate would meet me at, here at the White House on Friday morning at 10 a.m. I have hopes too, Roy. I have high hopes. Now, I'm going to appreciate all of the help y'all can give me. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. How's Mrs. Wilkins? Well, I'm mighty glad to hear that. Now, you give, give her my best, will you? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Walter, as head of the Council of Economic Advisors, you can be of enormous assistance to your president. Well, I know I wasn't voted in, Walter, but I'm the only president you've got. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, you know, I kind of got the feeling that Jack Kennedy thought that any country that he was president of just couldn't have any poor people. <laughs> uh, I'm here to tell you, we got a hell of a lot of poor people in this country. I, no, I've read your report, Walter. Well, I want you to know I agree with it. Not only is poverty wrong, but it's something that we can't afford. Now, I don't mind telling you, I intend to go down in history as the president who eliminated poverty. I'm going to introduce anti-poverty legislation next session to Congress, and I'm going to push them. I'm going to get it through. Now, my advice to you, Walter, you give it the highest priority. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. Hubert? Hubert? <laughs> Hubert! You liberals have a God-given opportunity here, but you don't deliver. You'd rather be out there on a the rubber chicken circuit, making a speech for a fee they already converted, than to be down on the Senate floor where, where you belong. No, no, you don't know the rules of the Senate. You never, you'd screw that up. We're not, we're not going to get damn Bill 1 passed, especially on civil rights, unless we have Everett Dirksen. We are going to get Everett Dirksen. Now, here's how we do it. You get a bottle of wild turkey, and you go down to his office this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, you just make him laugh. You just try. <laughs> well, let him know he's got a piece of the pie. You tell him that this civil rights legislation is going to go down in history, and he's going to go down with it, one way or the other. <laughs> well, Hubert, just use whatever influence you think you have left. And you tell Everett Dirksen that Lyndon Johnson may not have been voted in, but I'm the only president he's got. <coughs> when I took office, it seemed to me Jack Kennedy's policy was very clear. He looked at it soberly. We just could not permit Southeast Asia to fall into the hands of the communists. Now, when I assumed the presidency, we had 16,700 men already in Vietnam with two or 3,000 more prepared to move out there in rotation. You may check that out. Now, Jack Kennedy was strongly anti-communist. In October 1963, he approved a National Security Action Memorandum, number 263, which affirmed his strong commitment to do all that was necessary to help the people of South Vietnam win victory in their fight against the communist Viet Cong. In that same memorandum, however, he threatened to pull out 1,000 American troops in rotation and not replace them by the end of the year as a signal of his anger against President Diem. His purpose, which he communicated in all of the meetings, and in top secret telegrams to Ambassador Lodge out in Saigon was to put pressure on President Diem and his corrupt South Vietnamese government to get off their asses and fulfill the democratic policies that we were supporting out there and which your tax dollars were paying for. Well, about a month later, President Diem was assassinated, an occurrence which we naturally and wisely attempted to take full advantage of. 20th of November, 1963, Jack Kennedy directed McNamara, Mac George Bundy, and Maxwell Taylor to fly out to Honolulu to meet with the new leaders of South Vietnam and to prepare a second National Security Action Memorandum, number 273, which let stand a thousand man pullout as long as South Vietnamese troops were prepared to take those positions. And it affirmed Jack Kennedy's continued commitment to do all that was necessary to help the South Vietnamese defeat the Viet Cong. And it expanded that commitment to include naval surveillance off the coast of North Vietnam and covert activities inside Laos up to 50 miles and in Cambodia. On the 21st of November, those people flew back toward Washington with that memorandum for Jack to approve, but we had already gone. We had flown down to Texas. Well, Jack didn't come back alive. So on the 26th of November, 
It fell to me as one of the first acts of my administration to approve that memorandum. I wasn't happy about the situation. Already our being in Southeast Asia had begun to create serious divisions within the Congress and the country. Ho Chi Minh looked to be setting down for a long, tough fight. I had always known better than to get into a pissing contest with a skunk. <laughs> I want to tell you something, though, and it's this. The hardest task a president has is not to do what is right. It is to know what is right. I called in Secretary of State Rusk, Secretary of Defense McNamara, Maxwell Taylor, Chair Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and I said, is this right? Is this right? And they all said, we are headed correctly in Vietnam. So it seemed like to me the right thing to do was to continue to do what Jack would have done. So I approved this memorandum. Things went along for 18 months like this. And then 2nd of August, 1964, nice, peaceful, relaxing Sunday morning, three North Vietnamese torpedo boats attacked one of our destroyers, the Maddox, in international waters in a place called Tonkin Bay. Attacked unprovoked, like an old-time Indian attack. They came out of nowhere, they disappeared into nowhere. Well, you've got to find these bastards, and you've got to get them. Now, the first reports I got indicated several missiles been fired at our ship, and luckily none of them had hit. Then these bastards just disappeared into thin air like it never happened. I called in every goddamn little admiral I could get my hands on. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. You are telling me that the entire United States Navy is out there, all them ships, all them planes, and you can't find and sink three dinky little PT boats. All right. Here's what I want you to do. I want the Navy to continue these patrols off the coast of North Vietnam, and I want you to provide air combat patrol support over these destroyers. And I hereby issue orders to every commander to attack any force which attacks him in international waters and attack not only to drive them off, but to destroy them. You know what I'm talking about. God damn it. You all know what I'm talking about. God damn it. God damn it. I want the lights turned off when these officers are not being used. And you check these thermostats. I want the heat lowered. Where the hell is everybody? God damn. What the hell is going on here? Whose office is this? God damn it. I don't believe I'd trust a man who'd rather spend a Sunday evening at home than at the office. <laughs> I want copies of every memo on every desk in this wing. I'm not saying I don't trust people. I'm just saying you can't depend on them. <laughs> and I don't care how many advisors a president's got. He is alone. This is the loneliest job in the world. And I don't care what any former friends of the press might say. If I want to turn off a light, I'll turn it off. If I want to turn down the heat and save some money, I'll do that too. If I want to have a drink a glass of whiskey, I'll do that. If I want to have bad manners, I'll have bad manners. <laughs> I've got to have the freedom to do what the hell it is I need to do. And I want me some loyalty. I want my people to be 150% loyal, to kiss my ass in Macy's window and stand up and say, boy, wasn't that sweet? <laughs> I'm going to have what I want to have. Now, don't you try and tell me I'm not. <clears throat> and let it be known that Lyndon B. Johnson is a calm, collected statesman <laughs> who is the finest representative of the American dream. We had a lunch here at the White House with Mac George Bundy and McNamara and Rusk, and we had some experts in over coffee. And we had some ice cream for dessert. And we decided to bomb the North Vietnamese naval bases. <laughs> well, I could have been in big trouble. I was about to run as the peace candidate. <laughs> you may well laugh, but compared to Barry Goldwater, <laughs> I was the peace candidate. <laughs> yes. Oh, hello, Lucy, honey, how are you? No, you're not disturbing a thing. Yeah, 
Well, that's good. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got them. Well, they're right over there on the, on the coffee table. They're in that silver thing. Well, they're, they're very pretty, but a little too tall, but they're very pretty. <laughs> yeah. Well, how's Lynn boy? Is he? Is he right there? Well, put him on. She's putting my grandson Lynn on. Hi there, big buddy. How are you? What do you mean you don't know me? <laughs> well, this is your old granddaddy. You, you mean you don't recognize my voice? Oh, well, that makes your granddaddy sad. That makes your granddaddy want to cry. You want to hear that. <laughs> you want to hear your old granddaddy cry. Well, boo hoo hoo. <laughs> boo hoo hoo. <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> uh, boy, Lynn, boy, I got to go now. No, son, I got to go. Uh, well, get your mama back. But uh, I'm going to see you on the weekend. Listen, I'm going to send you a kiss over the telephone now. You ready for it? Well, here it comes. That's right. That's three kisses. Oh, bye, son. Bye-bye. Bye. You know, that is just about the smartest little kid I've ever seen in my life. The telegram. There is the matter of the telegram. I want to be absolutely honest with you now. I want to be absolutely truthful. August the 4th, 1964, just two days after the attack on our destroyer, I received a telegram from Captain Herrick, the commander of the medics, and when I opened it and read it, I just, well, I couldn't hardly believe my eyes. It said, in effect, to cool it. It said that the earlier reports might have been due to freak weather conditions or an overeager sonar man. In short, They'd seen no torpedoes, they'd seen no torpedo boats. And he suggested a complete reevaluation before action. Shit. I didn't see how I could bother the senators with that at that time. I called up Admiral Sharp. I said, we do not want to take any retaliatory action until we're absolutely sure what happened. And Admiral Sharp assured me that the attack did take place. It did take place. So it was all right. You don't have to see scalps to know that Indians are scalpers. I did not go off half-cocked in Southeast Asia. Oh, I'd learned a thing or two from Eisenhower. Ike was downright passionate about not making a move without the full cooperation of the Congress. Shrewd. I knew I had to get a piece of paper in my pocket before I could bomb those bastards. So I did. I got a resolution. And that resolution was like, well, it was like Grandma's nightgown covered just about everything. And it passed the Senate 98 far, only two against. And it only took the House 40 minutes to vote it in 416 to 0. When I sat down to dinner that night, I knew I was the president, and I knew that anything Jack Kennedy could start, I could finish. But whatever I said or did during that first term in office, I knew I was an accidental president. I hadn't been elected to the office, and I wanted the right as well as the name. Now, some people might tell you I get a little itchy and depressed when I'm on, God damn! Oh, man, that's a brand new Stetson. Well, some people might tell you I get a little itchy and depressed on the campaign trail, but by God, it was good to hit that campaign trail again. Uh, remind me of my first congressional campaign when Jake Pickle was my advance car driver. <laughs> I said, JJ, I want two things from you. I want a full gas tank and an empty bladder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that was a lovely campaign. Just lovely. We could have sat home on the back porch and not run at all and still won, and Goldwater was a wonderful opponent. Just wonderful. Had a wonderful slogan. 
somebody had made up for him, in your heart you know he's right. Well, I liked that slogan. I liked it a lot. And the reason I liked it so much was somebody immediately came up with, in your guts you know he's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and that took care of Senator Goldwater. <laughs> I was the first president from Texas! I carried 44 states in the District of Columbia. I carried Illinois by more than a million. I carried California, Michigan, and Ohio by almost a million. I carried New York by more than two million. And the goddamn Republicans lost more than 500 seats in the state legislatures. And I tell you, looking at those returns, I was in hog heaven. I was the only president you had. <laughs> and I'd been elected. Now, for the moment, we'll have a honeymoon with Congress. So I want you to get off your asses. Get my programs through before the aura and the halo, which now surrounds me, begins to disappear. Don't waste a second. We're on our way to the great society. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are sending uh, today an additional force of 50,000 men support combat troops to South Vietnam. However, I would be remiss in my duty to the American people were I to mislead them into thinking that more troops will not be needed at a later date. You know, it seems like to me that the last thing that we want to do is to permit a communist takeover in that little country. We're not going to abandon those poor people. Now, we've made a commitment to stand firm with them in a time of common danger. And that commitment's in the form of a treaty under CETO, which has been discussed in the full Congress and ratified by the Senate. And the time has now come for us to put up or shut up. And the American people honor their commitments. And they support these boys who even now, as we speak, are fighting out there in those rice paddies. And if Mr. Ho Chi Minh, who watches our television and looks at our books and newspapers and listens to our radio, if he believes otherwise, I would just like to disillusion him this evening. You know, it seemed like to me that, well, people are people. They want the same things in South Vietnam that they want in Texas. You give them a nice little house with some music playing in the background. You give them irrigation, good roads, rural electrification. That's all they want. That's all they've ever wanted. And that's all that we have ever wanted for them. Well, that and democracy, of course. More people have been killed in South Vietnam trying to vote, trying to get to the polling place and vote than have been killed by all the bombs in the North, and that's according to North Vietnam's own figures. So if you're all agreed that all it'll take to defeat these Reds is just a little bit more men, a little bit more money, well, then we'll go ahead. According to these reports I'm getting, they can't hold out for very much longer, so, but there's, there's something I want to know now, and it's this. Should I step up the bombing and get it over with fast? You're all experts out there. You tell me, and you give it to me straight now. Let's get down to the nut cut. A leader has to inspire. And in fame. The bill we are presenting tonight is called a civil rights bill. But in a larger sense, it is a civil rights program. 
Its object is to open the gates of the City of Hope to all people. Out yonder, beyond this great chamber, in 50 states, are the people we serve. Who can tell what secret hopes and dreams are in their hearts tonight? Who can tell what problems each little family faces? I believe they look mostly to themselves for their future. But I know that they also look to each of us. I never thought in 1928, when I was teaching school in that small Mexican-American community of Catula, Texas, that someday I might be standing here. It never even occurred to me then, even in my fondest dreams, that someday I might have the chance to help the sons and daughters of my students. Now, I do have that chance, and I'll let you know a little secret. I mean to use it. This was the first nation in the history of the world to be founded with a purpose. Our fathers believed that if their noble view of the rights of man was to flourish, it must be rooted in democracy. And the most basic right of all was the right to choose your own leader. There can be no cause for self-satisfaction, therefore, in the long denial of equal rights for millions of Americans. Rarely, at any time, does an issue lay bare the secret heart of America itself, but this issue of equal rights for Negro Americans is such an issue. And should we defeat every enemy, and should we double our wealth and conquer the star and still be unequal to this issue, then we shall have failed both as a nation and as a people. For with a country as with a person, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world but suffer the loss of his own soul? There is no Negro problem. There is no Southern problem. There is no Northern problem. There is only an American problem. Every American citizen must just have an equal right to vote. And we are going to give them that right to vote. So let this session of Congress be known as the session which did more for civil rights than the last hundred sessions combined. When it came to civil rights, my administration was not prepared to compromise in any way. I knew that the slightest wavering on my part would only provide hope to the opposition, whose strategy would be that they would amend this bill to death. I wasn't going to have that. I didn't want any amendments at all. But with my strong